Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we are doing the poem Captive with Ms. Rochelle Besidenat from Wirtschool Rustenberg, along with me, Marie Kutsia, and two other students, Laila Britt and Mufilwe Dube. Let's get into it. Hi guys, um, let me quickly share my screen with you. Let me just check. Okay, can you see? Good. Slideshow. Okay. Let's get into it. The poem that we are going to do today is called Captive. Now, who knows what the word captive means? Anyone? Man, that mean um, that you're um, held by something, almost like yes. hostage in a way. Exactly. When you are held captive, you are held hostage. You are taken against your will. Okay. So the title gives us an idea what the poem is about. So it reminds us probably of something like a prisoner or something. We will see. Okay, the type of poem is free verse, which we will also discuss a little bit later. And the mood changes from very anxious, and then it becomes nostalgic to anxious, which you'll see as we discuss the poem. The theme, captivity as the mind laborer is captive to his work. He needs the money to send home so that his family can survive. He's captive to the life that he is living. He has no other choice to better himself, get an education and better job. Captive um, is also captive to the fever and the illness that is causing him to hallucinate and imagine that he is back home. Okay, let's read the poem quickly. As a wild bird caught in a slipknot snare, the plaited tail hairs of a dun-colored cow, almost invisible. So, tethered in the toils of fever do I lie, and burn and shiver while I listen to the buzzing of flies that flutter vainly against cold, hard, deceiving window panes. Like them, I would escape, and escaping hasten to my home that shines in a valley afar, to my home, brightest tooth in the jaws of distance. There now, the cows I love are feeding in some quiet sun-washed vale, their lazy shadows drink the sunlight, rippling on the grasses. There, through the long day, girls and women among the mealies chant and hoe. Their swinging hoes are like the glitter of sunshine on water. There now, shouting happy herd boys, while they watch the cattle browse, are busy molding mimic cattle from clay, moist and yellow. There, when the sun has folded his wings that dazzle and has sunk into his hidden nest beyond the hills, all shall group together gaily around the crackling fires and chew the juicy cud of gathered day. And graybeards shall tell stories of ancient battles and cattle races of the days of old, of hunters bold and fearless who faced the lion's thunder and stalked the lightning leopard to his lair. But here, I burn and shiver and listen to the buzzing of flies against deceiving window panes. Okay, guys, so the poem starts off with this person who's sick in his bed, and all that he has to do is listen to the flies against window panes. Okay, the flies don't know the windows are there, and they try to escape. And then he thinks of his home. And basically, he describes his home um, in the second and third stanzas. And then in the last stanza, it comes back to his hospital bed, back to reality. So that's why we said the tone was anxious and then nostalgic and then anxious again. Does anyone know what the word nostalgic means? Um, to feel? Yes. Doesn't it mean to um, basically 
to remember to have a memory of um of old days but to also long for those days yes when you remember old times fondly and you long for them and you wish you could relive them hey so that is why the mood in the middle is nostalgic because he longs for his home while he's trapped in the hospital bed let's have a look at the first two lines as a wild bird caught in a slip knot snare now what figure of speech is this as a wild bird marley that's a simile ma'am it's a simile how do you know because it uses as yes when you have as or like you know that it's a simile okay he describes himself just like a bird a wild bird caught in a slip knot snare now i added a little picture here because this is a very visual poem you have to see it in your mind's eye in order to imagine the whole poem okay the, it's a very um the poem is written in pictures almost in images so the first one is of a wild bird not any bird not the um parrot that you keep in a cage at your house a wild bird that has been caught in a snare like this a little trap um that you set and when the bird steps in it it tightens and it can't get out okay so why does he compare himself to a bird that is caught in a slip knot snare do you think because he can't escape okay the bird compares himself to a wild bird wanting freedom from the situation that he's in the slip knot e is easily undone by pulling the tail in this example the snare is used as a trap to show that the bird is not harmed okay that he is um at one with nature as you'll see just now the plaited tail hairs of a dun colored cow what is dun colored ma'am is dun colored not something like brownish not it's not a yes. um yes ma'am yes dun colored means brown okay so they used the tail hairs of a dun colored cow to make the slip knot snare why dun colored do you think lila and not a black or a white cow for example ma'am because i am um, i think he refers to um the color of the tail that that um that the cow has he um he uses it as the snare so um that the birds don't see it yes exactly it camouflages on the ground or in the leaves of the trees hey so the bird can't see it it's almost invisible to them okay two animals have been mentioned now namely a wild bird and a dun colored cow almost invisible do you see the repetition of the t sound there it highlights how the fever has trapped him and he feels there's no way out the snare is almost invisible because it's the same color as the ground like laila just said so to that in the toils of fever do i lie people the subtitle of this poem is lament of a sick cause our mind laborer in a compound hospital so we know where this guy is from okay he is cosa and he um is trapped in this compound hospital by the fact that he is sick okay he is also trapped working in the mine where he would rather be at his village at his home so this next line says so tethered in the toils of fever do i lie what does tethered mean to be tethered means to be bound okay fasgemaak and toils means a net so this fever is like a net that binds him to his bed the sickness he can't leave he can't be at his home where he would rather be because he is fastened to his bed by this fever like a net that has caught an animal okay now we said that a simile you can recognize with the words as or like but in this case the word so does the same function okay the word so is used 
instead of as or like, but it's a synonym. Hey, it has the same meaning, therefore it's still a synonym. Ach, a simile. Um, it's still, he compares himself to an animal trapped in a net. And burn and shiver while I listen to the buzzing. Okay. Um, do we, why would he burn and shiver? Um, ma'am, maybe it's because of the conditions. Um, maybe he got sick quickly or something of such. Yes, when you have fever, your body temperature is not right. Hey, so one moment you are very hot and you are burning, the next moment you're very cold and you're shivering. Hey, so, um that is why he's both burning and shivering. When you have two opposing concepts in a poem like that, what do you call it? Can you remember? Isn't he antithesis or something like yes. that, ma'am? Yes, antithesis. There's a contrast there, hey, between burn and shiver. He's doing both at the same time. Okay, you can just make a note of that. Um, then buzzing is an example of onomatopoeia. He, it imitates the sound of the flies against the window pane. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Sounds like them actually flying. Of flies that flutter vainly. Do you see the alliteration there? Yes. Okay, guys, when you have alliteration, it always serves a specific function. And how do you know the function? You look at what the poet is actually saying and then say that the alliteration is enhancing that. For example, here, the flies that flutter vainly. Maybe it imitates the sound of their wings flapping. Maybe it emphasizes the fact that they are repeating this action again and again, but it's useless. Hey, It's done in vain, with no result, uselessly, in other words. So, do the flies have any success escaping? No, hey, they can't. Why not? Why can't the flies escape? Why can't they just go out the window? Ma'am, because I think the window is shut and they can't go through, so they just yes. try to fly against the window. Yes, they, f they get stuck. They bump against the window, hey. That is... Um, because they are only animals, they are only flies, they don't know that the window is there, it's see-through, so they bump their heads again and again and again against these windows. That's why the windows are described as cold, hard, deceiving window panes, okay? It's as though the window panes are liars, pretending they are not there when they really are. Okay, and what figure of speech is that when you say that the window pane is a liar? A deceptive person. Personification. Exactly. Because a window pane is not a person. It's not something that's alive. So it can't lie to you. Hey, it doesn't do this on purpose. But saying that they are deceiving is personification. It gives human qualities to this inanimate object. The window panes are deceiving because even though they can see freedom, they cannot leave. The window panes are personified with human emotions, emphasizing the hopelessness. They are clear. The flies don't know they're there. They can see outside and dream of leaving. Well, not they, um, because I don't know where the flies have dreams. But the mine laborer, hey, he can see outside he wants to leave, just like the flies. Like them, I would escape. So what makes him like the flies? The fact that he wants to leave. Okay, so what animals have been mentioned so far? Ma'am, a cow, the yes. uh, bird and the fly. Yes, and the flies and the bird are both trapped. Okay. They can't leave. Just like him, he wants to leave, but he can't because he is trapped. Again, we have a simile. Them refers to the wild bird and the flies that he is compared to. Escape is repeated to highlight the importance of freedom. 
Okay, people know inversion. Who knows what this word means? When you invert something, it means to? Ma'am, isn't it when you shuffle the um, sentence order? Yes, exactly. To invert something means to put it the wrong way around. So he says, like them would I escape instead of I would escape like them. Why does he do that, do you think? There's no rhyme scheme, so why do you think he um, inverts the word order like that? He wants to emphasize the word escape by placing the two escapes so close to one another. Okay, and he wants to emphasize that like them, he would escape. He is just like them. So it's just for emphasis for those two concepts, hey, that he wants freedom, that he wants to escape. And where does he want to escape to? To his home. Okay, he wants to go home, to my home that shines in a valley afar. In the olden days, there used to be these ships at sea. And the ships didn't have satellite naviga navigation systems and such. So when there was an island, they used to put this beacon, this light tower, um, on top of this the farthest point so that the ship wouldn't crash against the island, okay, or the mainland or whatever. So just like a beacon, his home shines in a valley afar. Why can't he go there now? Because it's far. Okay, he can't get a hospital to take him or an ambulance to take him from the hospital to his home. It's too far, okay? But it's like a, this guiding light. Does his home literally shine, do you think? Do you think the walls are painted with some kind of crystal paint that shines? No, hey, it's meant figuratively. It's like this beacon calling him. My home, brightest tooth in the jaws of distance. Now, people remember the metaphor and simile triangle where you compare what and what to why. Or you compare the two what's and then you have to figure out the why. Now, in this case, his home is compared to the brightest tooth in the jaws that are compared to distance. Why? His home shines. It's calling to him. Okay, that's why it's the brightest tooth. But the jaws of distance, jaws are things that can eat you, that make things disappear, like food, hey, that can bite you, can harm you. Just like the distance is something that makes his home disappear. It makes it just a dream, a place that he can't go to now because he's too sick and too far away from home. Okay, do you understand? It's like a double metaphor. Good. Now the next stanza. There now, the cows I love are feeding. Each part of the second stanza starts with there, as though he is pointing. He's seeing it in his imagination. Maybe he's hallucinating from the fever. It's as though he can see these cows that he loves. They are feeding, meaning they are eating grass. Okay, the cows are symbolic of a simple farm life, which is what the poet longs for. The image of the cow is repeated again and again, cows or cattle, because that symbolizes the life that he longs for. In some quiet sun-washed veil. Okay, so, um, in this valley, veil vale means valley. I don't know why... When I copied and pasted this um, from the Word document, it didn't highlight what it was supposed to highlight. I don't know why, but I highlighted all the words for you that um, have to do with water images. Okay, so you can just highlight water washed there. It's as though the sun washed this valley clean. Okay, the sun's rays are like water. They drench through this valley. They soak through it washing it clean almost, making it bright and nice looking. Okay. Their lazy shadows drink the sunlight. So the cows are standing there in this bright sunny valley. 
And the places where the shadows fall, it's as though the um, sunlight is drank, is drunk by these shadows, okay, creating it like a dapple effect with the sunshine. So are there any shadows? Yes, from the cows, they absorb, they drink the sunlight. Do you understand the um, image so far? You have to see in your imagination this valley and there are these cows feeding and the only shadowy spots are the cow shadows that absorb the sunlight. It's as though they are drinking the sunlight. You can highlight the word drink as well. It's also a water image. Rippling on the grasses. Now, if you look at the image there, it looks as though the sunlight is liquid on the grass. Have you seen when it's very, very hot, on a very hot day? It seems, the, the um, sunlight seems almost liquid, as though it makes these ripples on the tar road or on the grasses. That reminds him of the ripples that, for example, a wind would make on water. Okay, can you imagine that image in your minds? That's the first part. Okay, so he longs for his home. The first thing that he longs for in his home is the quiet sun-washed valley where the cows are feeding. And now, um, oh, there it is again. Okay, with the highlights and everything. Sorry, guys, I seem to have made two slides with the same thing. Okay, ignore the first one. Look at this one. There, through the long day, girls and women among the mealies chant and ho. People, I'm not going to explain every alliteration to you. We don't have the time. The word chant, what does that mean? Does anyone know? Ma'am, isn't it almost like um, singing, singing yes. repeatedly? Yes. Singing the same song repeatedly. It makes you work on a kind of rhythm. And it's an age old technique that um, people used to use where they chant while they work because it makes them work in a certain kind of rhythm. The word ho means to dig, to cultivate the land. Okay. The fact that they chant while they work means they are happy to do the work. So what are the women doing? While the men are watching the cattle or hunting or whatever, what are the women doing? They are working the mealy fields, the plantations. These swinging hoes are like the glitter of sunshine on water. Now there is a hoe, this implement. Um, and what is this part made of? Isn't that between plastic or steel? Yes, like a, um, a metal or a steel. And when the sun catches that, when the sun reflects off this implement, it looks exactly like the glitter of sunshine on water. Okay. And uh, again, we have these water images. There's a simile there. The sun shines on the hoe and it reflects, it sparkles, exactly like the sun would on water. Okay, there now, each time he has a new thought in the stanza, he says there as though he's pointing it out. Okay, shouting happy herd boys. What is a herd boy, do you think? What does it mean to herd? Isn't it uh, somebody who takes care of... Um like the animals and like they yes. make sure that they live together. Yes, the young boys in the village are responsible for making sure that the cattle don't wander off or get stolen or get eaten by predators. Okay, and are they happy to do this work? Yes, it says happy herd boys and they are shouting, playing, hey. You know how noisy little boys can be. You've heard them. While they watch the cattle browse. Again, this image of cattle, very important to rural life. Hey? Oh, and they are busy molding mimic cattle. 
Now, the toys of a culture tells you a lot about what that culture finds valuable. Hey, like um, modern day children in the suburbs that we live in, for example, the little girls play with Barbie dolls and Barbie cars and little baby dolls and such. That is what we find um, valuable. Little boys play with little cars. Do you think these boys would have fun playing with cars? No, they don't. It's not part of their frame of reference. Hey, so what do they play with? These little mimic cattle that they make, clay horses. Okay. From the clay, moist and yellow. Moist means wet. Okay, so all the blue highlighted words have to do with water. Why do you think water would be such an important part of rural life, of life in a village? Ma'am, I think um, water is an important part because um, they have sheep and they have herds of cattle and everything of that. So they need to feed them off of that water and they plant their plants there and everything. They are on their own. They don't need um, anything else except the water to manage all those things to keep them um, f um, fed and um, full. Exactly. Exactly. Water is an essential part. When there's no water, there's no life. Then they have nothing to drink, nothing to bathe in, nothing for their cattle to drink. Their crops don't grow. Hey, we know that they have crops because it says the girls among the mealies chant and hoe. Okay, now the last stanza. There, where the sun has folded his wings that dazzle. Now, this is a metaphor comparing the sun to a bird. The sun's rays to him look like the wings of this splendid, dazzling bird. Okay. And when the sun sets, he folds his wings and rests in his nest beyond the hills. Okay. So this metaphor extends into the next line. The sun is compared to a bird. Why? Because he has wings that dazzle and he has this nest, this his hidden nest beyond the hills where he goes to during the night. Do you think this is an appropriate comparison, considering the context and the um, whole of the poem, Marley? Do you think it's a good metaphor and effective? Yes, ma'am, I think so, because um, he talks about light a lot throughout the poem and how um, his home is a light to him, and now he's comparing himself almost to light. Okay, but he's comparing the sun to a bird. And do you think that's a good comparison? Yes, because it falls open and it um, flies away at the end of the day. Yes, exactly. And it's about rural life, hey? life in a village. So comparing one natural thing to another natural thing, another thing found in nature is quite effective. Hey? Because obviously animals, birds, water, the sun, these form essential parts of rural life. Okay, so during the evenings when the sun has set, they all... Um, grouped together around the crackling fires. The word crackling is onomatopoeia because it imitates the sound, you know, when you have a wood fire, that popping sound. Um, I don't know no, whether it's air bubbles or what makes that popping sound um, when you have a fire. Does anyone know? Anyway, that um, is what is imitated by the word crackling. And chew the juicy cud of gathered day. Now, there's a reason why I put a cow, um, a biological sketch of a cow and his intestines or her intestines there. What cows do is they have different stomachs and they eat the grass and then they swallow it and it goes into one of their stomachs and then they regurgitate it. They basically throw it up and that thing, that ball of grass that they throw up with some stomach juices is called cud and they chew it again and swallow it. Now the idiom to chew the cud means to think carefully about something. In this case now they use this and chew the juicy cud of gathered day. Each person tells the story 
of what happened during their day. There's this sense of community around these crackling fires. Okay, it's a, a bit, the idiom becomes a metaphor to talk about your day. Do you understand the image? Good. And greybeard shall tell stories of ancient battles. Dube, what do you think a greybeard is? Uh, well, when I hear the word greybeard, I usually, the first thing that comes to mind is somebody with a very large grey beard. But I think it leads towards somewhere where, with elderly people. Yes, like Santa Claus hey, has a grey beard. A grey beard is a word for old men because who has beards? Men. And whose beards would be grey? Old men. So these old men tell the stories of ancient battles. Okay, they don't have television or electricity or books to read or whatever. So what they do have are these stories that their ancestors tell that um, the old men in the community tells them. The greybeard refers to the elders of the tribe who usually led in storytelling um, and passing down of tribal wisdom. And what are these stories about? Of cattle races of the days of old. So something they did for entertainment, they would have the cattle race. Okay. Inversion, instead of the old days, um, they say the days of old of hunters bold and fearless who faced the lion's thunder so they tell stories about cattle races and about these fearless hunters okay the lion's thunder would refer to the lions roar hey and stalk the lightning leopard to his lair a leopard is very slow do you agree with me Are leopards slow animals? Do they run slowly? No, ma'am. No, it's they are very fast. Hey? So they are fast like lightning. And this lightning matches the lion's thunder. Okay, like lightning and thunder. And these are two very dangerous animals for a hunter to encounter while he's hunting. They can kill him. Yet... They are the ones that were so brave that they faced the lion's thunder, the roaring lions, and they stalked the lightning leopard to his lair. Why would they want to kill lions and leopards? Ma'am, it can be because, because um, the lion and leopard eats their cattle and endangers their, their stock of food and everything like that. Exactly. The lions and leopards are also predators. They are also hunters. So as long as there are lions and leopards, their cattle would not be safe and they would have less um, to hunt, fewer herbivores to hunt for themselves. Okay. Do you see the alliteration there? It emphasizes the speed of the leopard. And now we are back to the hospital bed. But here... I burn and shiver and listen to the buzzing of flies against deceiving window panes. He repeats what he said in the first stanza, that that is all he has to do. He can't sit and listen to the stories of graybeards or watch the happy herd boys molding their mimic cattle or listen to the women among the mealies chanting and hoeing or watch his beloved cattle. What he has to do is to lie in hospital bed the hospital bed and listen to the flies against deceiving window panes. Okay. Did you notice how all the images in the previous stanza started with there? Now this one starts with but here. He's not there where he wants to be. He's here in his reality that is not nearly as nice as his memories. Okay. Or his hallucinations. Okay, guys, that's the poem. Is there anything that you don't understand? 